Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the fourth of this year's Oxford uh, Botanic Garden and Arboretum Autumn Science Lectures, sponsored by Plants People Planet. Um, if you don't already know, my name is Simon Hiscock, and I'm the director of Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And it's going to be my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, but only after I've um, gone through some preliminary uh, housekeeping information. Uh, first of all, this lecture is being recorded, um, but your camera and mic are turned off, so you are not being recorded. Um, if you would like to ask a question to the speaker, then please use the Q&A function, um, and you can do this at any time, um, and we'll collate the questions and I will ask them at the end of the, of the talk. If you need to contact us about anything else, sort of technical or whatever, um, then, then please use the chat function and one of the team will get back to you um, in, in, in very quick form. Um, the recording is going to be made available for attendees after the event, um, and we will be sharing details about how to access this via the emails that you registered with. So now I'm delighted to welcome Professor Lars Ostergaard, um, tonight's speaker, who is the relatively new Sheradian Professor of Botany here at Oxford in the Department of Biology and at Magdalen College. This position carries the historic title of Keeper of the Botanic Garden. And as such, Lars is a trustee of the Botanic Garden and Arboretum, um, sitting on our board of visitors, as it's called here at Oxford. Lars is currently in transition to Oxford from the John Innes Centre in Norwich, one of the leading plant science research institutes in, in the UK and the world, um, where his research focuses on understanding the role of, of plant hormones in regulating plant development and diversity, uh, mainly through comparative studies uh, of reproductive tissue development in model plants and also crop relatives. Uh, in particular, he's focused on oilseed rape uh, and its model, Arabidopsis thaliana, for much of his research. Um, Lars is originally from Denmark, and he studied biochemistry at the University of Copenhagen, uh, where he received his PhD studying plant peroxidases. He then moved to University of California, San Diego, where he began studying the genetics of fruit development, which he went on to develop further when he moved to uh, John Innes through the inclusion of, of, of hormonal studies. Today, his focus has moved from oilseed rape to legume crops, uh, most notably peas, with the aim of providing and improving the performance of these high protein crops. The title of his lecture for us this evening is Fruit Development, Morphology and Evolution Driven by a Hormonal and Genetic Pas de Deux. So Lars, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very, very kind introduction. And um, welcome to everyone, and uh, and thank you very much for coming and tuning in. Um, I will now share my screen so you can see my slides, and I will start the presentation mode. Can you hear me, and can you see the screen? Yep, that's all good, Lars. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, good, yeah. So, uh, so thank you very much, Simon, again, for for the introduction and I'm going to talk to you this evening about some work we are doing both uh, with a, a fundamental focus just trying to understand the biology underlying and uh, fruit development morphology and evolution uh, but also I will talk to you about how we can use that knowledge to uh, try to understand um, 
crop relatives and, and how to improve crops. And in this case, I'm going to talk about the work we are initiating in legumes and in particular in pea. So typically in the animal world, oh no, I can't. Um, why can't I change slides? That worked so well before. Here we go. So typically in the uh, animal world, organs are developed and the main features of the adult individual already appear during embryogenesis, such that the main postnatal development is primarily uh, occurring by growth. This is very different in plants where the a simple embryo looks like looks not, nothing like the adult plant, and organs uh, continue to form uh, from these pools of stem cells that are positioned at the root and um, in, in the shoot that uh, gives rise to all the organs that we see in the plants, including roots, leaves, flowers, and also the fruits. Amazing in plants is the diversity that we see among plant organs. And it is here represented by leaves from various species, but of course also flowers show amazing diversity. And this was what Darwin, you know, this, uh, this explosion in diversity during, um, during evolution uh, is what Darwin named the abominable uh, mystery. Since he didn't think it fitted with his theories on evolution. Within the Brassicacea family that we have been studied, there is fantastic diversity among in the in the fruit shape, and uh, we're not the first ones to be interested in in diversity of fruit shape, and uh, and how fruit shape is controlled. That Ed Sinnott, who was a professor at Columbia University in New York, he already in the thirties, in the beginning of genetics, really in the early days of genetics, talked about that there's evidence that genes are actually in fact controlling the shape of of organs, and he was studying pumpkin at the time. We don't study pumpkin, we study a very well established model system, a model plant called Arabidopsis. And we like to compare it to a, a close relative called uh, Capsella rubella. And Capsella rubella and uh, um, Arabidopsis taliana are very closely related, as you can see in this phylogenetic tree that's, that uh, shows the relation in primarily the uh, angiosperm of flowering plants. And you can see Capsella and Arabidopsis are very closely positioned in this uh, phylogenetic tree. And despite the fact that they have such different fruit shapes, the origin of where the fruit comes from within the center of the flower looks almost identical. In fact, this is it's not possible to distinguish whether this particular floral meristem here originates from Arabidopsis or from uh, Capsella. But as they grow, they, <clears throat> from this meristem, they uh, produce very different forms. And you can see in Arabidopsis, if we look at the stages throughout development, from the very early gynesium to the mature fruit, we can see that it pretty much um, develops as a cylinder throughout development. And this is typical in the um, both the plant and the animal world, that the shape of organs are often determined during primordial development. But there are rare examples where post-primordial reshaping of the polyp metamorphosis takes place. And they, and they offer some nice systems to try and understand mechanisms that, that um, regulate fruit share or, or organ shape in general and uh, diversity as well. So in Capsella, you can see it has this early stage where it looks very much like Arabidopsis. Then there's a middle phase of development where the shape becomes disc formed and flat, very different from cylindrical. And only after fertilization do these outgrowths appear in the capsular shoulders that then eventually will lead to the heart shape that we see in the mature fruit. Again, we are actually not the first ones to be interested in capsella. George Harrison Schull from Boston, he reported in 1914, more than 100 years ago, that capsella Bursa pastoris or shepherd's purse um, existed also as a variant, a natural variant in nature that he called hegiri. And he, when he crossed the hegiri variant to the uh, wild type, you could say, uh, Capsella Bursa pastoris, he found that the segregation of 15 to 1. And this is believed to be the first 
report of a non-Mendelian segregation, so non three to one. But but George Harrison Schull already at that time suggested that this um, fifteen this this uh, uh, distribution of fifteen to one could be because Capsella bursa pastoris is tetraploid and not diploid like P, in which uh, Mendel did his experiments. So tetraploid means that there are two copies of the diploid genome. Uh, George Harrison Schultz's wife did some nice sketches for him for this publication. And, uh, look, and looking at cross sections, you can see here how the, um, how the uh, wild type uh, Capsella bacillus fruit is very wide and flat with the seeds inside, whereas the heterium mutant is short and, and, and round as well with the seeds all crammed up inside. And this reminded us of mutant reported in, in, from Arabidopsis uh, called Fruitful. And this is a paper from <clears throat> Marty Anoskis lab at University of San Diego, of California and San Diego from 2000, where this cross section of a fruitful mutant, a mutant that has a defect in the fruitful gene, shows almost exactly the same cross section as the sketch that George Harrison Schultz's wife uh, included in their publication. Compared to wild type up here, where you can see this is um, more round and bigger and has the seeds uh, inside there. So we were set out to then try and, and, and find out whether it was indeed the fruitful gene that is mutated in uh, this uh, hegery or in, in a capsella giving, giving rise to the same shape as the mutant in Arabidopsis. And this was because we thought that fruitful might be a good candidate for a, a, a key regulator of, of the shape uh, difference that we see between the two. So we did a big mutant screen uh, in the lab uh, with more than a thousand uh, capsella plants that were um, mutagenized with a chemical called EMS. And then we screened this population for mutants in the fruitful gene. And we found five, as you can see here, distributed along the gene where the purple boxes indicate the coding parts of the gene or the exons. And this is where we would expect that mutations might have an effect of the gene activity. And we found indeed that the one that we call Capsella rubella full dash one mutant um, with a mutation in exon four uh, shows that uh, a, a phenotype that is very highly reminiscent of the Hegery uh, phenotype that we identified, that, that uh, George Harrison Schull identified in Capsella bursa pastoris. This was work that we did in collaboration with Michael Linhardt's group at the University of uh, Potsdam. Uh, there are also mutations in other Capsella, uh, sorry, in other Brassicaceae uh, species in the fruitful gene that also look very similar to what we see, for instance, in Lepidium campestra here, that has these disc shaped uh, fruits. But the mutant, the, uh, uh, the fruitful mutant in that species similarly look like the uh, fruit that the full mutant in Capsella and in, in Arabidopsis. So this suggests to us that fruitful might not necessarily be the determiner of shape per se, but more a promoter of growth overall. So we continue to look for ways of trying to understand what, how, how the shape is formed in Capsella and therefore understanding diversity of fruit shape in the Brassicaceae. And to this end, we then look closely at these uh, uh, developmental stages here from stage 12, which is prior to fertilization, so prior to pollen fertilizing the ovules inside. And then over stage 13, which is at fertilization, and then 14, 15, and so forth will be post-fertilization growth when the, um, when, the, when the heart shape appears. And to this end, Yang Dong, who was a postdoc in my group and now has his own group in Beijing, he uh, used a marker line, a marker line that uh, um, contains the, the yellow fluorescent protein reporter, which is then only associated with uh, the plasma membrane, as you can see here in these close-ups. So uh, outlining, <coughs> excuse me, all the individual cells. And this allowed Yang to do live imaging and track each cell throughout development. And in collaboration with Matthias Maida and Richard uh, Smith from the Joanne Center, we were able to make these uh, lineage tracking of the whole organ of uh, Capsella. We only show half of the organ here. Um, but for the whole organ, we did this 
um, lineage tracking, so we could track each cell and find out how it developed or divided over time. And this particular image here shows in um, heat maps of the cell size in a micrometer square. And on the, you see the graph on the other side here, on the right side, shows the distribution of cells. Each of these dots are individual cells um, that is mapped both in compared to where they are along the, the, uh, the axis of growth and also then in how big they are in terms of their, their area. But we can get much more information uh, from this about the dynamics of, uh, of the uh, capsular growth. So it's, if we look at differences between the stages 12 to 13 and stage 13 to 14, we can then look, follow specifically where cell proliferation uh, occurs. And here I only included the top part and the basal part of, of, these, of these fruits here, uh, in both in, at the top and at the bottom as well. And here we can see that there are many cell divisions. These are the red dots, are cells that are dividing throughout development. And there are more cell divisions occurring at the early stages here than at the late stages. Similar with cell growth. Cell growth is not particularly pronounced in the early stages of development, but much more pronounced later on, and in particular here, as you can see, at the basal part of the fruit. But when we look at anisotropy, that's the direction of growth. Let's see where we take the uh, length divided by the um, by um, so the uh, length divided by the width of the cells. We can then uh, uh, re record how in what in what direction the directionality I would say of of growth. And here, very interestingly, we can see at the basal part here a very high level of directional growth towards the um, towards the uh, valve tips, the tips of the fruit here, where the heart will form to this stage of the of development. So all this information is very interesting and it's it's in a way descriptive. We'd like to understand a bit more about the mechanism that drives these dynamical growth patterns. And to this end, I'd like to introduce the first, the um, uh, one of the most important plant hormones called auxin. And the uh, molecular structure of auxin is shown here and is also known as indole-3-acetic acid or IAA. Auxin comes from the word auxane, which means to grow or increase uh, in Greek. Auxin has been known for a very long time as being uh, important for plant growth and development. And uh, even uh, Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin and his son Francis, they did work uh, in the 1800s on, um, on the effect of light on plants. And they also concluded or hypothesized that there must be a compound that uh, regulates the growth so that the, um, so that the plant will grow in the direction of the light. And in fact, we do know now that oxygen accumulate on the opposite side of the growth of the light source. So to increase growth on this part of the plant to direct the plant to grow in the direction of the light. Similarly with gravitropism, oxygen is responsible um, for um, sensing gravity so that the plant knows what is up and what is down. And it can also sense um, uh, where, where water is and direct the growth of the roots towards a water source known as hydrotropism. Another important role of auxin is um, in apical dominance, which is where the uh, primary shoot will usually grow higher and uh, more pronounced than the secondary shoot. And this is because secondary shoots are inhibited by auxin produced at the very tip of the primary shoot. So that when you remove this, the tip of the primary shoot, uh, branching uh, can occur more pronounced as in this uh, uh, drawing shown here. Auxin is produced in a very simple pathway from the amino acid tryptophan over IPA to IAA. And it's these two enzymes here that are uh, responsible for catalyzing this, this pathway. First, TAA catalyzes the first step, and Yoka, uh, the Yoka enzyme family, catalyzes the following step, the final step in the biosynthesis of IAA. And we found that members of these enzyme families are expressed at the, um, at the tips of these valves or these C, uh, uh, pots uh, from, uh, from a capsella during development. 
and not only the, the TAA family, but also the Yucca family are shown to be expressed in these regions here. So uh, we then hypothesize that if we, if we knock out or make mutations in these genes, will we then also see a defect in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the heart shape formation? And indeed, that is what we saw. We generated a, a knockout line <clears throat> of uh, TAA1 by, by uh, using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and found that these fruits are not, no longer able to make these uh, heart uh, protrusions. So um, we were interested in trying to find out a bit more about um, how auxin mediates this effect. What is the interaction between the hormone here, the auxin, and the genetics of, um, of fruit formation, fruit shape formation? And to this end, we looked again at our mutant population, and we identified various mutants that we called heartless, heartbreak, braveheart, and sweetheart. And to find out more of the sort of uh, uh, pieces of the genetic puzzle that is involved in forming uh, the heart shape. And in this way, we were able to sort of decipher and, and, and um, uh, reveal a genetic pathway, genetic and hormonal pathway that regulate food shape. So we know now that a protein called heartbreak activates another protein called CR. AIND that is responsible for production of IAA or auxin, specifically in the fruit valves, in the tips of the valves. We then also know that IAA functions by activating some auxin response factors or ARFs in the capsella fruit, in this case, number six and number eight. Those ARFs we have found by this uh, genetic analysis activates a factor that is particularly relevant for uh, and required for maintaining um, on an undifferentiated state. So a state where cells can still proliferate. And that's exactly what is re required and what we had observed about from our uh, lineage tracking analysis and, and live imaging that this is required to form, uh, to continue growth of the, um, of this, of the uh, fruit valves and making the heart shape of Capsella. So, this is all very good. We know now know how uh, the capsular heart in, in, in some details now is, is formed. But of course, it's also quite interesting to find out whether this is something that is conserved, um, a mechanism that is conserved to, and can explain the diversity that we see in the Brassicaceae family. And in order to find out a bit more about that, we then looked at the, uh, this STM gene in many species within the Brassicaceae and more than 40 species. And we found that there was a complete uh, and very strong correlation between, uh, uh, be between species where STM was able to auto-regulate, to activate its own expression, and, there, and the ability of these species to undergo metamorphosis, so essentially change shape from the uh, unfertilized state to the mature fruit. Whereas other species were unable to make this change. They still have very different shapes, but the shapes are pretty much the same between the un, the uh, unpollinated, the unfertilized uh, stage of growth in the gynecium and the fruit themselves. And we, so we therefore hypothesize that this is that STM, the ability of STM to regulate itself, to maintain cell proliferation ability of the cells that are, that are um, dividing during fruit development is what is required for, um, for, for fruit shape diversity. So this was a part of the talk where, which was mainly, was primarily uh, very fundamental in nature where we are interested in just finding out how things function and solve biological questions. A, a few years ago, just before the, um, the COVID lockdown and the pandemic, we decided to see if we could use some of our knowledge in uh, understanding the genetics and the hormonal regulation of shape, fruit shape, to um, address both fundamental and also applied questions um, in, in the legume family. And as you know, the legume family consists of many very important crops that are, um, that are important for many aspects of uh, both fruit and the, and the environment, um, because the growth of those crops release much less uh, greenhouse gases per unit area and other crops, they also require less input for, for their growth, the less uh, nitrogen because they're able to fix their own nitrogen. 
and also carbon sequestration. And they uh, can be used to regenerate uh, soils that have been grown for in over more generations in um, and, and seasons with other crops such as cereals or brassicas. And also they provide a really um, a high quality source of, of food with high proteins. So they have benefit to human health in terms of their protein richness, contains minerals and vitamins. And they also have been shown to reduce cholesterol and blood sugar. So many good reasons to un try and understand and maybe improve uh, the performance of legume crops. And if we look at the effect of, of, um, of various foods on, on, the, uh, on the planet, on sustainability, we can see that peas, for instance, and, and, and soybean or tofu requires much less land to produce a, a similar amount of proteins compared to, for instance, uh, lamb and beef. And similarly, for uh, when it comes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we also see that um, that there's much less production of those gases when growing tofu, for instance, or soybeans uh, and peas. So these are, are both strategic, environmental, and uh, health um, aspects of of legume growth and understanding uh, and improving legume uh, crop performance. But of course, we also know that. Um, uh, Peas that we are focusing on have a fantastic history in, in science and in genetics when uh, Gregor Mendel first formulated his theories about how um, um, <clears throat> about genetics in terms of segregation and inheritance uh, using various traits of uh, in the peas in this case, what is shown here is the purple flowers. So today we have massive resources to both understand and improve uh, pea formation. And at the John Innes Center, we have this, what we call the Mental Seek Diversity Panel. It contains more than 700 different uh, lines of pea that shows a fantastic broad phenotypic diversity, both in case of fruit shape and fruit growth as we've shown here, also height, disease resistance, uh, um, uh, stem uh, growth, leaf shape, and um, and also germination. These lines are fully sequenced. That means their whole genome is now known, and it's therefore possible to go in and carry out what we call genome-wide association studies to pin down what are the genes that contribute to various traits. We also are in the process of developing P transformation, by which we can then use both as a research tool but maybe also in the future for crop improvement by um, changing the expression of certain genes, either by general transformation or also using P virus-induced gene silencing. Um, we are trying to specifically uh, aim at um, developing one variety called GI2822 as a model system for, um, for, for our studies. And that's because it's a, it's a dwarf plant. It doesn't require much space to grow. It uh, has a very short generation time of less than three months from seed to seed. We have a very high quality genome sequence of, of this variety. And we also have what, we, uh, what is called a fast neutron population. That's a mutant population where uh, certain parts of the genome have been deleted. So we can see and follow the effect of, of deleting specific genes. We are then developing in Oxford what we call a tilling population, which is also a mutant population where we can look for mutations in specific genes. And as I mentioned, we are setting up transformation and gene editing. And I'd like to thank the people who are uh, shown in this picture for their contributions to setting this up, both Neil and Monica and uh, Noel Burkhardt, Claire and Sauna from the Jolina Center, but also Eric Belfield, who is working with me now here in the lab in, uh, in Oxford. Also, peas produce auxin. And I want to show you a little bit about some preliminary work we are now doing with a, um, a different auxin, a halogenated auxin, an auxin that pea produces that has chlorine uh, attached to the, its position 4, and therefore we call it 4-CL-IAA, or 4-CL auxin. This is a, um, a molecule that is not produced by, by many species in nature. In fact, it's only a subset 
a salt clade within the legume family that produces this auxin variant for CLIA. Uh, P. Sumsatibum, which is P, is, is one of the producers. And then there you can see that I've listed four species up here in the Fabiatri folia uh, tribe that uh, produce, that is known to produce for CLIA. But Sisa, uh, which is um, uh, a, a, a legume, I think this is chickpea, which is just outside this clade, it does not produce fossil IA, and neither does these other legumes that are a member of the clade. We know that in 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 the in the um, species that produce fossil IA, they are very high in the seeds, but very low in the rest of the plant tissues. And it's also known to particularly promote the growth of the pericarp. So that's the growth of the fruits. And we have also tested this. So Mark Bell is a student in the lab, and Phil Robertson, who is our Photographer at TIC have made some uh, time lapse movies here where you can see a pollinated uh, pea fruit will grow um, normally after pollination. But if we remove the seeds inside, this growth will not take place. I have started the movie on the right as well, and you can see absolutely nothing happens to the growth of the pot if the seeds are removed. In fact, in at the end of this movie, you will see how this pot on the right will just wither up a uh, fold or around on itself and, is, and eventually die out. When we add IAA to a um, to auction, so the normal auction to a, a deseeded pot, nothing will happen either. But 4CL IAA has a massive effect on pot growth. So even without the seeds, if we add 4CL IAA, you can see on the right side here that these pots they grow uh, to pretty much full size. Uh, without the seeds inside. So this suggests that it is the 4CLIA, the, the auxin variant that is produced by the seeds, that is a trigger for the pot to grow after fertilization. And we like to understand more about this. And in fact, Mark is um, going to continue this work during his PhD. And also, this is going to be a big focus of the in, in, in the startup of my lab uh, in Oxford to understand the function of fossil IA in pot growth. Because with this understanding, we might be able to improve the formation and the growth of, of pea pots and maybe also the seeds inside. Um, we find it very interesting also that by understanding how the 4CL IA functions, uh, we will need to separate the biosynthesis of this hormone from its ability to signal um, the growth of the pots. So for instance, Trigonella phenom grecum, um, also known as fenogreek, the uh, spice, um, belongs to this clade. So they produce 4CL IA, but you can see in the graph on this side over here, that they're not able to, to differentiate between the normal auxin or the auxin variant, the IAA or the 4CL IA. Because when you apply IAA or 4CL IA to a deseeded pot, the, the um, uh, trigonella pots will, will grow equally um, after application. Whereas, as you can see for PISOM, as we showed before on the, in the videos, it's only for CLII that it induces growth. Whereas for bean, uh, fasciolus, coccineus, uh, there's, no, uh, there's also no, a, no, no ability to differentiate between the IAA and the 4CLIA sigma. I want to finish by showing you a bit about what we're doing on specific traits related to, to, uh, to, to P development. And this is the first I want to show you is, is that a, a trait called the, the blunt nosed P pots. And that's because we have noticed that, um, that peas, uh, P pots, they, uh, they come in different shapes, especially at their apical end, where you can see either a pointy shape as in this, um, uh, on, on the on the right side of, of the panel over here, or on the on on blunt or as blunt, blunt ended or blunt nosed pea pots, and we've noticed that in many adverts for pea pots, what we find is that the bluntness of the peas is highlighted as something attractive. So very often we see in these you see in this one here the pea ambassador is a dark green blunt pots. We have um, blunt fibrous pots. And we have blunted pots filled with up to nine sweet tender peas. And when I spoke to 
growers and breeders of pea, they say it's because there's more room. There's room for at least one more pea at the very end here, where this is more difficult to get them to develop at the end, at the tip of, of a pointy pea. But also, there seems to be an association between disease resistance and bluntness as well, um, which is something that I don't think is, is understood exactly how that association um, occurs. But again, um, this is a trait that was already remarked upon by William Bateson back in 1905. He found um, at that time that, that the bluntness, the, 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 um, the BT, the capital BT, compared to the mutant, the, uh, the small BT, the, the capital BT, the bluntness, was dominant over the pointiness. And that this is, could serve it as a single Mendelian trait, so, so three to one. Um, and this means that uh, there's probably just one locus or one gene that is regulating this, this shape. So we have set out to try and find out uh, how, how, what gene that might be. So we've used this JI2822, which is the model P that we're developing um, into a, a model system. And then we have also looked at a, a variety called Cameo. And Cameo is sort of a reference variety for P research. It's the first genome that was sequenced, and this sequence was uh, genome sequence was published in 2019. So it's it's yeah, as a reference variety. But if we cross these two together in the F1 generation, what we see is a blunt uh, P uh, <clears throat> hybrid between these two, and this suggests again that this is indeed that blunt uh, bluntness is dominant over pointy. So. Um, uh, you can see that I've just indicated that here with different colored lines here, the point, the bluntness versus the, the pointiness. So um, Mark Bell in the lab, he did a screen of a mutant population in GI2822. And he found one line that showed the pointy, pointy parts, as you can see here, the bluntness of the wild type GI2822 compared to the pointiness of this, of this mutant here. And that, of course, provides a fantastic tool now to try and understand what the gene is that is mutated in pointy to give the, the, uh, the, uh, that particular shape. And if we cross the pointy mutant to cameo, as you would expect in the F1 generation, we get a pointy uh, phenotype, which again suggests that the locus that um, is mutated in the pointy, in the, in the pointy uh, mutant is uh, the same uh, mutation that is occurring in the cameo uh, pointy part as well. So we have now uh, isolated uh, genomic DNA from the pointy and from the wild type GI2822 and sent them for sequencing. When we get, get these sequences back, we then expect that we will be able to identify what, uh, what um, gene is mutated. But to help with this, we have then also done a TWAS a, a, a genome-wide association study using this massive uh, diversity set that we have at the Jordanian Center. And I will not go into the technical details, both because I'm not quite sure, sure I understand all of them myself, but also because it would take a lot of time. But it's essentially what we, where we, where we have uh, identified is that on chromosome three, at the top of chromosome three, there's very high association between um, genetic diversity and uh, bluntness and the pond bluntness trait. So that suggests that the gene is lying in this region. And when we have um, uh, exploited a random, uh, a recombinant inbred line population at the Uranus Center between the cameo pointy variety and another blunt variety called GI281, we could also do genetics and uh, phenotypic analysis and identify an area of the chromosome that uh, where that, that particularly associates with bluntness of, um, of the pots. And this area is also located at the top of, chromos of chromosome uh, three of, uh, of P. And in this particular region that we have identified, there are five candidate genes that may, one of them may be the blunt gene. But this is what we're going to analyze when we get the, our um, genome sequences back, um, hopefully within the next couple of months. 
So I'll just finish here by saying that we want to identify a plant both for, for breeding reasons, but also to, for our understanding of um, how fruit shape is, is regulated in peas. And then also for Bateson, because Bateson is just not anybody. Bateson was the first director of the Jolene Center, and he was also the person who came up with, uh, who coined the word genetics in this letter, as you can see over on this side here. So there, so in his honor, it would be fantastic to be able to identify what is underlying the blunt uh, phenotype. So with, with, with this, I'd like to thank the people who have been involved with the work. So this is my current group at the Jolene Center, uh, where we are slowly in a transition to come over to, uh, to Oxford fully. I'd like to thank Aaron, Suby, Mark, and Neil from the Jolene Center, and Eric, uh, Luke, and Megan, who have started with us um, over in, uh, in Oxford. And then i also like to thank the funders uh, for making the work that we have done uh, possible. And then I'm very happy to take questions if you may have any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Lars. That was a, a great talk and some delightful slides um, that really brought everything, everything you were saying to, to, to life. Um, that yes, and I, I noticed at the bottom of your last slide that you your sponsored you you've got income from Carlsberg. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, this is a project that has that I did not talk about today. It's, a, um, it's in fact about rice. It's a, I'm not leading this project, I'm a collaborator, but we are trying to um, understand, um, it's using ancient DNA from lake sediments in, uh, in China, um, uh, from, from rice pollen, to try to understand how rice genes have been selected for breeding over time, and how those selections might have been lost in, uh, in, in extant, varieties and maybe we can bring some of those um back to life that were selected for at a certain point in history but that's a very different from what i've been talking about today yes i, I was just interested by a yeah. a, 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 a brewer, brewing industry company that, that that would be more interested perhaps arguably in barley was giving yes but it is, the idea is also, I guess, from their point of view, that they might take some of that knowledge with them and then transfer that for improvement of barley. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, um, and there, there, there's a, a a question that's that's come to me um, from um, a, another source. Um, it's it's more about this. Um, um, the, the this this IAA variant with the with the chlorine group on it, yeah. Um, one of the you have those those four genera in that that clade that produce it, um, and one of those genera is Medicago, yeah. which produces some of the most extraordinary fruits in the um, yeah. amongst the legumes, the Fabaceae, yeah. Um, as have you or anyone else looked at, at at some of these these fruits and how they how they develop and and the relationship between auxin and and the chlorinated auxin in 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 some of these extraordinary sort of um, whirly fruits yeah. of of medicago. We have not looked at medicago because. Because the Medicago, Medicago fruit are, as you say, quite complicated and quite complicated structures. Um, it will be will be very interesting to look at once we know the genes that are involved in the production of fossil IA. Mm. When we know what what they are, we can then begin to uh, knock them out and find out what is the effect of fruit development uh, if we do not have um, in the absence of these uh, of fossil IA. And then we can use the fantastic genetic resources in Medicago that are available uh, to then also try to understand the role of Medicago, of a fossil IAA in, um, in developing that complex and complicated Medicago fruit. That would definitely be interesting. We have not done anything with Medicago at this point. 
Well, it would be extremely interesting. Um, yeah. Those those spiral fruits and extraordinary yes. shapes that they produce. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay, questions coming in now. Um, and here's one. Lars, you use developmental genetics and computational modeling to study how fruits acquire their shape with a focus on peas. Would it be useful to look across subfamilies in the Fab ACP family? There are some very odd shapes. So this sort of relates to what I've what the other question was around Medicago. So yeah. any more to add to that? Yeah, well, absolutely. I completely agree. There's a fan, there's fantastic resources. So the the 700, um, the set of 700 varieties in um, in P from the Giorgini Center that are all sequenced will be a, a massive resource. It also contains other species than Pisum satibum. Um, it goes go, as Fulvum, um, Abacinicum. There are a, a range of other Pisum species as well in that population. Mm. So, um, I completely agree. There's uh, there's so many resources out there, and with the advent of of genome sequencing uh, mm. at, at the scale that we can do today, and um, is is it makes there's so many opportunities to identify important uh, regulatory genes of various traits that we are excited to be looking at. Right. Well, here's here's a question that's going to um, sort of almost test your horticultural abilities as well oh, no. <laughs> um <laughs> the broad beans on my oxford allotment did badly this year uh the pods grew but not the beans inside an effect of poor pollination perhaps or or maybe something hormonal yes it sounds like it's probably poor pollination mm. i am not sure how much broad bean uh, pots themselves will grow in the in the absence of pollination if they do uh, this uh, parthenocarpic uh, mm. growth, uh, I am not sure. Maybe it it depends on the variety as well, not the different varieties that are able. But um, yeah, I I can't say. But this it sounds like there's so seed filling. It sounds like it must have been an issue in this case here. Um, yes, yeah, I I think it's either pollination that, that yeah. they're not not producing the the the, the fertilized. Um, embryos and therefore seed development or or something else but there's been plenty of 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 moisture yeah. this this summer so it's not as though they're 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 water stressed like they might have been in 2022 where no. you didn't, didn't get such great great uh, fruit formation that's right yeah yeah so here's another one um your 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 work examines comparative reproductive tissue development in model plants and crop species. Could we look at some of the basal angiosperms to infer evolution? Yes, I think this refers to you showing quite a lot of, you showed um, Amborella trichopoda in your floral yeah. slide at the beginning. So yes. what about some of these, these, these early diverging angiosperms? Yes, they are extremely useful for for the work that we do. We have also used the uh, amborella, in fact, and uh, and water lily as well, to try to um, untangle evolution of uh, auction signaling pathways, for instance, that we have we have um, identified. So um, there, there's also some work that I did not talk about, but where um, where we have found that a certain way that auction so so auction. Uh, IAA has um, been detected, you know, in land, all land plants and also in some algae. So it's very, very old hormone, very, very old molecule, and it has roles in um, in the in the in the early land plants, also long before flowering plants. But some ways of oxygen signaling we have found only emerged in flowering plants, and we have uh, traced it back to, for instance, to Amborella. We know that this mechanism is specific. Um, and it specifically was introduced when with flowering plants and is important for gynesium development, in fact, mm. um, in flowering plants. So mm. yes, so so these resources that are now available as well for amborella and for water lily um, and other species um, it, it are, are really useful to us and we use them. We use them a lot. Because mm. mm. down there is also 
um, star anise as well, which has that yeah. extraordinary fruit. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Fascinating diversity of flowers and fruits in those those basal angiosperms. So yes. yeah, lot of lot of um, potential for research there. There is with, yes with with all your amazing tools. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Um, and here's one about your long term with the long term applications of your research, particularly to increase yields. Yeah. So um, this is uh, something that we are constantly thinking about. Where is it that our expertise can be useful for um, increasing yield? Uh, not only in P, the long term would also be to try and transfer some of the knowledge we obtain in P mm. um, to other legume crops, maybe some that are more uh, grown in uh, tropical regions um, and some that are not as domesticated as, for instance, pea and bean and beans are. Um, so it requires constant communication with people who grow these crops and, and, and with companies who breed um, the legume crops. And uh, we have various ways of of of, um, of interacting, uh, of meeting um, those different uh, stakeholders and, and discussing with them. And I, I always come away with uh, many ideas about how we could do things and 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 know and um, and much more educated about how uh, how how crop improvement really does take place. And um, for instance, from my experience in, in with brassicas, is that we um, often held some uh, workshops where we simply just where we where we, where we invited uh, people from various areas of both industry and academia to try and find out where is it that that our expertise could be useful. And this is what I'm hopefully uh, going to continue with with legumes as well. And 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 so far it's been working very well. We have an EU program that just has started up called Legume Generation with 35 uh, partners across Europe, uh, including many companies as well, where uh, we meet, we met in Germany a couple of weeks ago to try and understand where we can, where we can, how we can bring us together. And this is where the long term will be for me, uh, will be to how can we contribute our experience with developmental genetics to improve uh, legume crop formation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another question has come in, um, which is more important to the consumer, taste or quantity of peas? Are you looking at, at genes that determine taste? And in brackets, I love in, in capitals, medic seeds. Okay. I don't know what medic seeds are. Uh, it must be a company or something that produce okay. seeds, of yes. particularly flavorsome pea. I would suggest. Yeah. So in, in my lab, we don't have the we don't have that expertise in in metabolism in in in, in, in metabolic pathways, which are, um, I guess, determining the compounds that uh, contribute to taste. But I know this is definitely a trait that is uh, a lot of focus on uh, also in the breeding industry for, for peas, um, especially if using pea protein as a, as a substitute, for instance, in um, plant-based uh, meat, for instance, that is being produced uh, where maybe the pea taste is not um, that attractive. Um, then it's important to, of course, develop varieties. And I think Claire Domini at the John Innes Center, she has been instrumental in the developing varieties that have less of the pea taste. I like the pea taste myself. Mm. Uh, I think is uh, yeah. I don't understand, quite understand why we have to get rid of it, but some people do not, and many people don't, perhaps. Mm. Uh, and uh, and it will allow us to also maybe import less uh, soybean uh, for if you could grow our own pea for these purposes, for uh, for the purposes for which we normally import soybean. But for this to happen, I guess we will have to make varieties that have less of the uh, of the pea taste. 
Yes. But it's not something that my, my lab is, is involved in, uh, but it could be through collaboration. And, I mean, it just occurred to me when you were you were talking there about different um, flavors that come from 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 different different sort of pea legumes. Uh, uh, is it possible to to do sort of wide crossing of um, different groups of, of of pea relatives? For instance, uh, could could you potentially cross a, a pea with a chickpea? I don't know the answer to this. Um, I doubt it because the different yeah. species. Uh, so I'm not sure that they, that will be possible. But I guess understanding what it is molecularly that um, that gives pea that taste would, would probably would mm. maybe be a better way forward in order to uh, try and, uh, and omit it uh, in a more targeted way, uh, for instance, through uh, gene editing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking you, that, that there have been these wide crosses between a, a radish and a, a cabbage, for instance, yeah. in the brassicaceae. Is that sort of wide crossing possible in the in the in in amongst the pea relatives, for instance? Just just a thought. Yeah. Yes, I I don't know the answer to it, uh, Sarah, but it it is something to definitely to consider that if if that might be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we haven't got any more questions to come in, um, which means that we're going to finish very much on time, which is 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 good in some respects. But I, I, if there are any more questions, um, there are a couple of minutes. So please put one in if you want to. Otherwise, I'm going to um, call a halt. Um, no more coming in. But I thought it was great, Lars, that you, you you managed to include Mendel and and Bates and yeah in in your talk this evening, the man who discovered genetics in the form of the the yeah. Mendelian segregation, but didn't coin the term genetics, and then ending with Bates and who introduced the the term genetics yes at, at that memorable con conference in the. Um, uh, early 1900s so it was a nice historic context as well both involving the P yes. so thank you very much Lars thank you very much uh, welcome you, welcome to Oxford on behalf of all us in the audience as the um, new Sharadian professor and uh, thank you we look forward to hearing more from you and seeing more from you um, thank you very in much in the coming coming months and years so thank you Lars. thank you um, it's very well, exciting to be in oxford i am very excited about this yeah. so thank okay. you everyone well thank you and good night everybody but um there is one more lecture um coming up next week from yad vinda marley um who's a professor here in oxford who'll be talking about um tropical forests so so do please join us for that mm -hmm. And also, can I ask you to um, give us some feedback this evening by um, scanning the QR code and telling us um, what you thought about the, 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 the talks that have come so far and any suggestions um, and general feedback is, is always welcome. So I'll look forward to seeing you next week for what will be our last um, autumn science lecture and um so without further ado i'll see you next week and thank you again lars and thank you everyone for joining us this evening good night